Okay, how often do you get asked to assess somebody for pulmonary hypertension? That's the purpose of this talk, to give you a perspective as a radiologist where you might fit in to assessing pulmonary hypertension in a subcategory of patients. We're going to be distinguishing between pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary hypertension per se, looking at the classification schemes that are applied clinically, review briefly the pathophysiology. There's been a lot of advances over the last decade. And then look at the CT and MR features that you might be asked to assess. And then look at the perspective that is given by our clinicians to the therapeutic trends to individuals threat threatened by this condition. <clears throat> Looking at the various causes of pulmonary hypertension, the majority are going to be post-capillary causes, that is systolic or diastolic dysfunction, mitral or aortic valvular disease, and then some rarer conditions which we'll allude to. We just heard about the primary respiratory causes of pulmonary hypertension, severe lung disease, but we're seeing more and more patients with obesity and sleep disorders, and obviously thromboembolic disease. We can make some categorization efforts there. But really, at this pre-capillary level, this is where we're talking about a, a large number of patients now that previously had no hope for therapy and are actually being assessed and actually receiving some novel therapies that actually do affect patient care. So pre-capillary pulmonary arterial hypertension. The WHO classification, again, the clinicians are going to be using this category from one to Roman numeral five, but in the large group of idiopathic, collagen vascular diseases, HIV, toxins, and mild peripheral diseases, it would be classified as grade one. The pulmonary venous, grade two, being the most common, secondary to cardiac disease. And then hypoxia, grade, it would be the uh, classification grade three. Four is the pulmonary thrombolic. And then some of the rare conditions that we'll just spend a moment on. What is the definition of pulmonary arterial hypertension? This is obviously diagnosed clinically, uh, often at cardiac cath, but pulmonary arterial hypertension at rest greater than 25 millimeters with the normal range of 12 to 16 and 30 at exercise, and then without any mean LVED pressure elevation, normal 5 to 12, would help us diagnose these pre-capillary patients. And then the severity index is indicated below. <clears throat> what are the mechanisms? The pathophysiology range from cellular and molecular level diagnoses related to vasodilatation with prostacyclins, nitric oxide, vasoconstriction, endothelium agents, serotonin, clearly coagulation disorders, inflammatory disorders, and endothelial cell dysfunction. These are circulating and cellular mediators are beautifully illustrated in this particular illustration that shows the numerous interactions that can lead to the cell surface damage, nuclear transfection factors. You don't need to memorize this. It will be in your handout. But simply put, as a radiologist, we have to think, what can we contribute to this understanding of the pathogenesis of primary pulmonary hypertension? There's going to be vasoconstriction, vascular remodeling, and possibly in situ thrombosis. Pathologically, the understanding is one of plexiform arteriopathy, interval fibrosis, medial hypertrophy, adventitial proliferation, and again, possibly areas of in situ thrombosis and recanalization. The subsequent physiological changes that affect the patients are those of the loss of capacity to dilate and recruit unused pulmonary vascular bed. So these individuals have severely impaired gas exchange, leading eventually to core pulmonary and right ventricular failure. Idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, there's no discernible cause and no left or right shunt. They present often, as I mentioned, with greater than 70% obliteration of the vascular bed with a female predominance. Some gene mutations encoding protein receptors have been identified as indicated here, and they're going to present with dyspnea, 
often chest pain and weakness, generalized weakness. Now, very often, we're not the first people to diagnose. This is on cardiac echo. The patient may have already undergone cardiac cath, but I'll show you some of the features that we may see as a radiology community in these individuals. We may see the main pulmonary artery enlarged, greater than 29 millimeters. We can use the PA to aorta ratio of greater than one. The pulmonary artery is greater than the bronchial size in at least three or more lobes. And then we may see mosaic attenuation, as just illustrated by Dr. McAdams, but without any air trapping. And this represents peripheral vasoconstriction. So the pulmonary artery, I don't think we'd have any trouble diagnosing that. The mosaic perfusion without any air trapping may be a feature that indicates chronic pulmonary arterial hypertension is in this individual. CT will also show diminished pulmonary vessels, sometimes with dilated bronchial arteries, and then septal lines. And some of the more rare conditions may be associated with central lobular nodules. That would be those conditions such as venoocclusive disease, plexiform angiopathy, or a capillary arteritis. Diminished pulmonary vessels often are better shown on reconstructed images, and this is a nice illustration of chronic pulmonary arterial hypertension with decreased peripheral vasculature. Bronchial arterial hypertrophy can occur for a variety of causes, often seen with chronic thromboembolic disease, but these bronchial arteries are very prominently illustrated in this particular set of axial and reconstructed images. Central lobular nodules, whilst uncommon, may be seen with a variety of rare conditions. And just to look at this patient's lung windows on the right, the first glance may not elucidate these tiny central lobular nodules, but that plus the pulmonary hypertension may specifically lead you to a rare condition, which we'll talk about. And here again, these tiny central lobular nodules with pulmonary hypertension. CT may demonstrate also reflux of contrast into the hepatic venous, azagous system, and even bowing of the interventricular septum in late cases. And here's a dramatic example of idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, but you can see the dramatic infravacaval reflux. Here, another individual with bowing of the septum, quite remarkable bowing of the septum, almost narrowing the left ventricle. Cardiac MR is quite useful in assessing patients, particularly for right ventricular morphology, function, and mass, and these are prognostic factors that are used in treating particularly patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. It can also help us assess the mean pulmonary arterial pressure and is used in selected patients to assess both treatment and monitor right heart response to therapy. Cardiac MR, we demonstrate uh, increased end diastolic and at end systolic volumes with right ventricular hypertrophy, right atrial enlargement, interventricular septal flattening and bowing. And it's a better tool to really provide us with quantitative assessment, not only of function, but also assess individuals for ventricular mass index, stroke volume, and ejection fraction. And here is a, a schematic, I think if it plays for us, just showing you exactly the sort of assessment can be done both morphologically and uh, quantitatively using cardiac MR in these individuals. A couple of specific uh, cases of uh, pulmonary hypertension associated with liver disease. Portopulmonary hypertension is seen in less than 1% of cirrhotics. But if you are in a transplant center, up to 4 or 15% of transplant candidates will have this condition. They may have, uh, if they have mild symptoms, but they have a poor prognosis post-transplantation. A variety of factors have been implicated, including uh, toxins passing the liver, endothelin-1, and shunting of vasoactive compounds. What it looks like is any other case of pulmonary hypertension. Here is an individual with pretty severe pulmonary hypertension secondary to uh, liver disease. And you can see dramatic increase in the size of the main pulmonary artery and the very tortuous circuitous 
pulmonary arteries. They wouldn't mistake this for anything other than pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary veno-occlusive disease is a rare condition, but up to 25% of misdiagnosed as primary pulmonary hypertension. They have a normal or low peculiarly web pressure, and CT may demonstrate septal lines and ground glass centrilobular nodules in this individuals. So it's something you might think about if you have pulmonary hypertension with some funny-looking lung disease. You can always Google the appearances of this rare condition. Another one, again, rare things, just to round it off, but you may be the first person to suggest it as pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, and again, a typical proliferation of capillary-like channels with these funny-looking ground glass and centrilobular nodular opacities in individuals with pulmonary hypertension. And here again, I'm not expecting you to make this diagnosis, but if you have the right setting, it should trigger perhaps a Google search. So where do we sit in the therapeutic considerations for pre-capillary hypertension? I mentioned that in the past, really all we had to offer these individuals, and they're often young women, supplemental oxygen, diuretics, anticoagulation, calcium channel blockers. But now there are many other options, including prostacycline derivatives, endothelium-1 receptor blocking agents, and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Other patients may be considered for atrial septosomy, pulmonary endarterectomy, or even lung or heart transplantation. So the prognosis for this rare condition has improved with some of the better understandings that have been elucidated uh, by cellular-mediated mechanisms. And here is uh, a very nice uh, overview of the various therapies which go range from vasodilator therapies to anti-inflammatory uh, therapies, vasodilator and antiplatelet therapies, anticoagulants, and inhalational therapies. So I think it's important that you are able to be part of that team that's helping manage these uh, individuals severely afflicted by this condition. Here is an algorithm which I think just puts this all in context. Clearly, we're not going to be the first people to make that diagnosis more often than not. We've seen a chest X-ray. We'll learn to rule out underlying pulmonary parenchymal disease, but we know that's not always a reliable thing to be doing. Echocardiogram is going to be the first line for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. It can also help out rule out the cardiac diseases that I elucidated as being the commonest causes, rule out into cardiac shunts. We can then, with a VQ scan, something offer uh, would be to rule out thromboembolic disease, but often these patients will be coming to you with multi-detector CT to try and rule out a specific cause either anatomical as uh, pulmonary emboli, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis, interstitial lung disease. We may also see shunts that perhaps haven't been diagnosed. Cardiac MR is usually reserved to help us assess in a more precise way functional analysis of the right ventricle and pulmonary circulation, both at baseline and on follow-up and pro provide tools for progressing uh, assessment with therapies. And then right heart cath is intervened usually about this point to confirm the diagnosis and obviously in the uh, response to various therapies. So thank you for your attention and I hope that provides you with insights into something that I think is an interesting and evolving phenomenon. Thank you. <laughs>